So now let's go into the topic. It's my great pleasure to pre present Professor Fiona Rowe, um, who's with us today. Um, just to let you know, the meeting's been pre-recorded, um, but Professor Rowe will be present for the Q&A section afterwards. So any question you have, please put that format. Uh, just some words on Professor Rowe. She's a professor in North Optics and Health Services Research at the University of Liverpool in the UK and has, her research focuses on both static and kinetic visual field evaluation, control of ocular alignment, but also acquired brain injury. And Professor Rowe is also the author of two excellent textbooks, uh, Visual Fields via the Visual Pathway, which contains plenty of examples on all kinds of static and kinetic visual field testing. I can highly recommend that. And another textbook on clinical RFOP days. So thank you, Professor Rowe, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Fiona Rowe. Thank you, Monica. So Professor Rowe, uh, for many decades, really, kinetic perimetry was the only means available for visual field testing. However, when static perimetry was invented in the 1970s, uh, it has largely overtaken kinetic perimetry. Could you maybe start by explaining us the differences between the two visual field testing methods? Yeah, of course. Um, well, kinetic perimetry is well described by its name. Perimeter means a boundary and perimetry is a measurement of the boundary. Kinetic means moving, so kinetic perimetry essentially is a measurement of the boundaries of the visual field or the boundaries of a field defect by using a moving target. Um, the target typically comes from an area outside the patient's visual field area, and they respond as soon as they become aware of that target in their field of vision. Static perimetry means that the measurement of the visual field is done in a static way, so the targets are shone on and off, and the patient responds if they've seen that brief flash of light. Um, kinetic perimetry builds up a series of visual field boundaries, and that's based on the patient responses to small and large sized targets and using different brightness levels for those targets. And you can see that on the bottom right of this slide, the red area is a peripheral boundary to a large bright target. The blue area is the central boundary to a smaller and a dimmer target. And the areas shown are for the remaining field of vision. There's a blank area where the visual field is missing, as in this case of a right-sided hemianopia. A static perimetry will build up a sensitivity map based on the brightness of the targets seen at the specific points within the field of vision that are tested. And you can see that to the top right of this slide. The worse the visual field, the darker the colours are. So the clear, clear area to the left side of the chart shows normal visual field, but the black area to the right side shows the defect. Okay, so basically you can use both methods to map out the same defects, right? Exactly. Nevertheless, um, I think there are quite specific preferences for one over the other in certain instances. Could you explain um, the key advantages of kinetic perimetry compared to static testing? Yeah, um, well, the, there are quite a few advantages, but uh, I think it's probably first important to say that we should also know the advantages of static perimetry, not just kinetic. There really should not be a competition about kinetic versus static perimetry, but actually it should be an informed choice as to what's best to test the visual field of your patient for, dependent on their condition and the ability of the patient to do the test. And also remember that we typically incorporate some static testing into kinetic visual field testing as well, and there's sta standardized strategies for doing that, which have been in place since the 1960s. So the table on this slide shows an outline of the advantages for static or kinetic options. Static is really, really good for finding small sensitivity changes, and that's why it's ideal for glaucoma or macular testing. But depending on the type of visual field defect, Kinetic offers a better spatial re resolution. And what that means is that if you have a defect with a steep boundary, it's more easily outlined by kinetic perimetry with the moving target. Then with regard to patient ability, kinetic is ideal for testing patients who find visual field testing difficult. And that includes young children, patients who've got low vision, 
but also adults who have cognitive or attention difficulties. This slide shows the dimensions of a 24-2 static field within the wider boundary of the visual field on a kinetic template. Now, static perimetry works really quite well in small areas, for example, the, the central 30 degrees of the visual field. However, if you want to test a large area, static is going to take forever, whereas kinetic is much faster. And I think the slide that you can see here shows much more clearly visually compared to words why static testing would take so long for a good peripheral field measurement. It's very interesting. And I mean, for everyone having done full field static testing like myself, um, it's quite painful to do. And so to sum this up, uh, for which clinical applications uh, would you use or do the vast majority of people use kinetic testing? I use kinetic perimetry when it's appropriate for the condition, but also appropriate for the needs of the patient. Um, as an example, I use it a lot with neuro cases. We see many patients with stroke and brain tumors in the clinic that I do. Um, we do use it for monitoring the blind spot. Um, for example, patients who are on certain medications. I don't personally see retinal patients, but I know colleagues who use kinetic perimetry for their retinal cases and other colleagues who would use it to plot the impact of ptosis on the field of vision. But there are also indications where visual acuity is very low and kinetic perimetry in those cases is, is very flexible as a choice. And that flexibility makes it very useful for testing children or people with learning difficulties and also patients whose neurological condition means their difficulties with cognition and maintaining their attention. Um, and last, I'm an orthoptist by training, so I really can't talk about kinetic perimetry without mentioning that it really is an excellent assessment for eye movement measurements. When we have patients with double vision, we can plot the area of single vision versus double vision very accurately in a kinetic field. And where we need to measure individual muscle function, we can also plot accurate uniocular fields of ocular rotations. Excellent, um, the summary of yours. Do you think other institutions and practices would make the same choices on when to use kinetic perimetry or do you think that varies? Yeah, that question's a little bit harder to answer because um, I can't formally answer for many other practices, but I, I know what, what we do and, and what many of my colleagues do. And naturally there are going to be variances in how people use kinetic perimetry because of the types of conditions they may deal with more than others. I do have some information on neurological conditions and the variances um, in practice in, in different areas. And that's based on a systematic review we did and published in 2018. The aim of that review was to evaluate the use of perimetry in common neurological conditions. Now specifically, these were idiopathic intracranial hypertension, optic neuropathies, chiasmal compression, and stroke. And the review included um, 330 studies. And in addition to capturing the types of perimetry programs, which is shown on this slide, we also logged data on the patterns of visual field loss reported in these conditions. The most common forms of perimetry were the Humphrey 24-2 and 30-2 programs and Goldman kinetic perimetry. So as you might expect, peripheral field patterns were reported more for stroke and chiasmal compression, while central field loss patterns were reported more for IIH and optic neuropathies. And what this slide shows is that static perimetry was used far more for IIH and optic neuropathies, whereas static and kinetic perimetry were both used um, fairly routinely for um, stroke and chiasmal compression. But what was evident was that the program choice was often not informed by the condition and the expected field defects for that condition. The 24-2 program was used a lot, despite the fact that it's not designed to test peripheral visual field and its lack of diagnostic accuracy in that regard. So further research is now ongoing to evaluate this further. And we wanted to find recommendations for testing in neuro disease that is informed 
both by the condition as well as the related visual field defect patterns, and not simply by familiarity with just one specific program type. Which, of course, um, from a practical point of view, makes a difference, right? Yeah. So let's start looking at the chiasmal and post-chiasmal lesions that you talked about before and the benefits of kinetic testing. Can you explain more in detail what the benefits are, how you test there? Well, first of all, I think an awareness of how visual fear loss develops is helpful for these types of lesions. In chiasmal lesions, we see the majority of our cases anyway, having pituitary adenoma more than other tumors or neurological conditions affecting that particular area. Um, pituitary adenomas first compress the inferior part of the optic chiasm, and that corresponds to our superior field of vision. These days, patients are much more likely to be detected earlier on than say 20 or 30 years ago. So although I still see some cases with extensive bitemporal hemianopia, it's far less. And more often, I see mild bitemporal superior defects. Now, static threshold perimetry quite often will detect these mild superior defects. However, the restriction of central testing to 24 or 27 degrees superiorly, depending on whether you choose a 24 or 30 um, degree program, it does mean that early superior defects that are further up, higher up in the field of vision can be missed. And in addition to that, if you only plot the central field, you don't know how far that defect extends, if a field defect actually does exist. So this is where kinetic perimetry is good in these circumstances. We can concentrate on that superior area much further to 50, 60 degrees up, and we can use both kinetic and static testing in that area. So by doing that um, and you know, plotting the full visual field, we get far more information on how much of the visual field is actually involved in what is rel a relatively quick testing session. Now, a few years ago, we looked at diagnostic accuracy specifically for pituitary adenoma cases and comparing kinetic fields. Um, if you go back to the previous slide, Monica, Sorry. that's all right. Um, so we were compa comparing kinetic fields with 30-2 and 24-2 data, and these were um, this was in patients with known visual field loss. So what this slide shows is the comparisons between the central static testing and the kinetic testing um, for the, the left and right eyes and, and both eyes combined. Now, overall, comparisons showed that static testing with 30-2 missed 15% of defects that were present and 20% of defects were missed with the 24-2 program. And these, in all cases, these were defects that were confined to the outer superior field. Now, some clinicians assume that kinetic testing is going to take much longer than static testing, but we showed in this study that actually the testing time was not substantially different between the two. Kinetic testing took under 11 minutes um, and static testing was a mean of nine and a half minutes. And bear in mind that kinetic needs a larger area, including, but it includes static points and it provides more diagnostic detail. So that extra minute is, and it's worthwhile. So the slide you've moved on to now actually relates to a different study. Um, and this would be post-chiasmal lesions, and we've done extensive studies with neuro cases, particularly stroke survivors with visual field loss, and most of those would be hemianopias, as, as you might expect. So from a practical point of view, um, we will often, often see patients at a very early acute stage for a diagnostic assessment, and because of this, we have to allow for fatigue, cognition problems, and so on. Now, this is where we find kinetic perimetry invaluable because you can slow the test, pause it, repeat the vectors, alter them, you know, whatever you need to do. And that interaction with the patient helps to get a reliable field. But it doesn't have to be detailed in order to get enough information. So going back to a point earlier, if you only do a central, a central field, you can miss peripheral defects or miss that the peripheral field is actually not badly affected. 
And it's very well documented that central fields don't predict the peripheral field or vice versa. So what this slide shows, again, is information about um, testing. Kinetic perimetry is much faster than people think. Um, this slide shows the results from our studies comparing a kinetic testing program to a static peripheral program, the full field 120. Um, now, kinetic testing was under five minutes per eye in comparison to over six minutes per eye for the static peripheral program. And it is important in neurological conditions, just as for ocular conditions, that we consider functional vision. And that what we mean by functional vision is that's the entire visual system of the eye, the visual pathway and the brain working together. And we need to know about this for daily life activities such as mobility and navigation. Um, and because of that, we need to know about the peripheral field and not just what is happening in the central field. If you move to the next slide, please, Monica. You know, we, we show this effect, um, particularly in relation to functional vision and peripheral field, um, as in this example on this slide. And this is one of our stroke survivor fields of vision where the bulk of the field loss is in the peripheral infratemporal visual field. And that defect was not fully represented by the central static test for that patient. And this is also um, applicable to other disease, um, such as for glaucoma patients who've got moderate to severe disease. So really it's not uncommon for the central and peripheral visual fields to be mismatched. And that's why we need to be aware of what's going on in both central and peripheral visual fields. So do you have any practical test tips for our tips or visual field technicians that test chiasmal and postchiasmal lesions? Um, yeah, there are a few things I consistently do with these patients. Um, if you know what the defect is likely to be from the outset, then my recommendation is always that you would start where that defect area is. Get that area outlined properly before the patient fatigues or loses attention, and then you can move to better areas of the visual field as they are less likely to be affected so much by fatigue. Um, another option is to plot a minimum number of vectors in each quadrant, so you more quickly find the affected area. I always plot either side of the vertical and horizontal meridians first, as that quickly will pick up on any vertical or horizontal step defects, and they're quite important features in both neuro and ocular disease. Definitely make use of the reaction time vectors that you have within um, kinetic perimetry on the Octopus 900, because being able to adjust for delayed reaction times can make a big difference in the quality of the visual field result. Um, use reliability checks by plotting vectors to test false positives and false negatives. Um, these are very, very easy to plot. Um, in addition to that, I would use long vectors if there is a known defect. So for example, in, in a hemianopia, I would take the vector across to the other side of the visual field as that helps to, to delineate the vertical boundary much better. The, the system on the 0900 is if, if you click on the screen, it automatically takes that vector into the center. So what you need to do is drag and drop instead for the longer vectors across quadrants. Um, I do exactly the same for blind spot and make longer vectors so that you do get a response when they eventually see it. And that just means that you, you don't have to reset the vector um, and retest if you happen to come across a very large blind spot. Also make your explanations clear. Tell the patient, you know, they're looking around, you can see the monitor, you know. Um, in fact, there's two monitors. Um, and tell them when to expect a dim light or a bright light, you know, giving them good information, information and telling them what to expect. Good instruction does not necessarily bias a patient's performance. And actually, it, most of the time, it makes it better. And that's something the same with static testing, right? If somebody knows what to expect, they can do it much better. Yes. Um, 
here's an example of some templates that you've developed and validated. Um, I would call it something like a starting point um, that you always use. Uh, can you explain us a bit how they work and how you validated them? Like, I mean, why do they look like this and not any different, anyhow differently? Yeah, sure. Um, so this, this has been gone up, going on over quite a number of years. And, and, you know, over the years, we put together some templates initially for research studies that have now been incorporated into um, our clinical practice. They're largely based on knowing what types of visual field loss we're looking for um, or the need for a practical screening assessment. We first started to use standardized templates back in the 1990s um, before the Optimus perimeter was available for kinetic perimetry. We, at the time, we used the templates for Goldman perimetry because we needed standardization to do the same testing procedure, making sure that that was repeated properly over several visits or if it was being done by different examiners. Once we started using the octopus, we customized those previous templates and stored them on the perimeter um, through, through iSuite. The templates are useful for us because we still have a number of different examiners testing visual fields um, with, within our clinics. And we also have more than one perimeter in use. So by using standard templates, we've had, we have more confidence in having more repeatable visual fields, despite the fact that different examiners will, will introduce variants. And um, the slide um, shows our pituitary template on the right side and the left side template is a screening test. And one really nice advantage of kinetic testing is that you never lose what you've done is if the patient is unable to complete the test. So for example, if we had a stroke survivor doing the screening template on the left, um, you know, early on after their stroke, they might manage the kinetic vectors, but they might only manage a few of the static points bef before they're unable to continue any further. And that actually isn't a problem in real life. The kinetic vectors still give us a lot of information and we can create the eye softer, we can field, um, save the field. Um, however, if a patient gives up during a static test, then the same isn't the case. And we, we more often than not lose the data that, that has been collected so far. So the templates work well for us in both a screening assessment um, and also in a diagnostic um, situation as well, where we can capture a fair amount of information, but if we can't continue the test, we've not lost everything. And they're nice in the sense that you can write add and delete responses and vectors. So they're yeah. not just a rigid kind of Absolutely. fixed set, right? Of yeah, tests. They're, they're, they're a template. So they're there as a guide to the sort of visual field test you can do in certain circumstances. And if something isn't looking right, you can adjust it, alter it um, and you know work from there but it's any template is only ever a guide. Have you seen an increase in standardization across different technicians in your clinic um, using these templates? For us, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, bear, bear in mind, that I do, most of what I do links into research usually in some way, shape or form. And you know, you, you really do need some introduction of standardization. Mm -hmm if you're gonna do tests um, and certain strategies repeatedly from visit to visit, as well as with different clinicians. So we definitely have far more confidence from using those templates as a guide. And I mean, that's important for clinical practice as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and the whole point of doing research is you're trying to improve things for clinical practice and you want to see these things implemented into routine clinical practice so that you also have the benefit there. And that, that's what research should do. It should inform evidence-based clinical practice. Very well said. Um, so let's move on um, to the next area of kinetic testing. That's blind spot testing. Um, what are the benefits in blind spot testing of kinetic testing? So yeah, benefits of kinetic testing for blind spot. Um, yeah, so I think we need to go back to kinetic perimetry being flexible and the very interactive nature you have with this type of testing. Essentially, blind spot testing 
is no different than mapping a scotoma area. Um, you know, it, it is an area without any visual field within it. So first of all, um, kinetic testing of the blind spot is a fast assessment. Um, there is usually a very clear boundary between the blind spot and the seeing visual field that surrounds it in, in most cases. And because of that, there's high resolution. Um, now, if you look at the schematic on, on the slide, you can see that testing the blind spot can be quite hit and miss in a standard 30 degree testing program because there may just be one or two points that fall within the blind spot area. It, it just depends on the location of the blind spot. Um, you can choose a static testing program just to specifically test the blind spot, but that takes a lot of time. And the example you've got on here, there are 30 test locations in that example. You can just imagine the time that would take. Or you can rapidly test with kinetic assessment ju with just a few kinetic vectors or with a combination by adding in some additional static points. There's also more control, I think, with testing the central area near the blind spot with kinetic testing. So it's actually easier to map the central defects that might be within that area. Um, now if you move to the next slide, it gives an example. Um, and Having, having good control over testing that central area is important from a diagnostic point of view. You do need to know if the blind spot is separate from a central scotoma or whether the defect is connected, um, as in this example of a secocentral scotoma. And that really is important to aiding the accurate diagnosis of the underlying condition. So. I think it's it's quite easy to do that and quite quick to do, to do that in kinetic. Depending on the type of program you would choose for static, it's not always so easy to see that distinction between a central scotoma having visual field and then going on to the blind spot scotoma area as well. Right, often resolution is an issue there. Exactly. Um, confusing matters. Um, any practical tips and tricks um, on blind spot testing? I mean, it's quite a small area to test, yeah. right? It is. Um, so the interaction with the patient, as I've mentioned before, is really important. Um, I treat blind spot testing the same way I do as if I'm actually looking to map a visual field defect area. So to do that, you need to choose a slow stimulus speed. And I typically choose three degrees per second. Whereas for outer boundaries of the visual field, I will, I will choose a, fa a faster strategy, um, usually five degrees per second. For the blind spot as well, I use relatively long vectors, which I've mentioned before, because otherwise, if you have a large blind spot and your vector isn't terribly long, there's no response. So you have to plot that again and, and drag the vector out um, a longer distance. So it's just easier to draw in large vectors in the first place. Um, I add in reaction time vectors nearby, um, and I also add in static points um, to, to just get a, a, a clearer area. And this is uh, the blind spot template that you developed, kind of summing up what you just explained. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the slide, um, it, yeah, it's the template with the features I described before. We, we do see a lot of patients with um, IIH who, who would have um, larger blind spots because of papilledema, but we also monitor patients who are on various drug treatments. You know, one example is Vigabatrin. Now, most of the time we don't need to concentrate specifically just on blind spot testing because we do get sufficient information from static visual field testing. But from time to time, we, we will have some cases where we want to look more closely at the blind spot and you know, we'll use this template. Um, I should point out that there may seem to be quite a lot of static points on this particular template. But it's important to remember that the, that the static points on kinetic are not the same as on a static threshold test. On kinetic, they're only tested once. You either see it or you don't. So because of that, they're plotted very, very quickly. And the red ones are the reaction time vectors that you mentioned. Uh, could you give us a brief description on how they work? So you've got, um, we, we plot the reaction time vectors um, close in to the blind spot. Obviously, if the blind spot is larger, you, you need the reaction time a little, uh, the reaction time vector a little bit further out again. 
Um, but the reaction time vector means that you, you're plotting it in an area where the patient already can see. So the moment that light comes on, the patient is actually able to see it. So the computer will document uh, or record the time from onset of the stimulus to when the patient responds. And that's the latency period from when the patient saw it to reacting to it. Um, and that will give you, you can then adjust for the, that reaction time variance with the patient. It allows then, um, if the reaction time is very long for the blind spot to be increased or decreased in size. And, and the same with reaction time vectors that you would put in for other parts of the visual field as well. Um, but the, knowing whether the patient has an, a very long reaction time um, or a normal reaction time is, is quite important and does affect the size of the visual field defect or area that you get. And it's another means of getting more consistency into the results, right? Definitely, yes. So let's move on to a totally different group of patients, uh, children. Can you explain why you're using kinetic testing for children? Yeah, um, well, testing, I have to say, testing children can actually be good fun, but that's my personal experience. It's not everybody's personal experience. Um, in reality, though, if you just remove age, the indications for kinetic testing are the same for many of our acute neurological cases. So you need cognitive demand, attention, ability, and fatigue, all of those factors to be taken into consideration. So for children, if children can understand instructions and their behavior is good enough, they'll do static testing very well in general. But showing understanding and being well behaved do not always <laughs> apply as those of you who work with children or those of us who are parents will know. And so you need to be more interactive with children if, if that's the case. And your testing needs to be adaptable to what the children are doing and how they're responding. And that's exactly what you have with kinetic testing. And the nice thing is that you can mix kinetic and static testing so it's less boring for children. Um, you know, you can say to children, I'm going to try and catch you out. Let's see how good you are. Um, so that interaction is really, really good. Whereas, you know, if it's just a full static threshold test that they're going to sit through, that's not going to be easier for them to do. I mean, I can just remember the uh, hearing test my four-year-old had to do. In the middle, he said, I don't want to do it anymore. This is boring. Yeah. Um, so I think the practical here is quite important. Um, do you have some other pieces of advice? Um, what to do practically? Well, back to being interactive again, isn't it? Um, children are naturally interactive because that's how they develop and learn. Um, I do think it's probably easier to test them d these days because they're so used to computerized games. I mean, my one of my nephews is four. Uh, the other one is 14 months old. Both of them very adept with mobile phones. Um, and, and that's the same for pretty much all children. Um, so they're, they're now used to computerized games. And I think although children may be nervous about being in a hospital clinic or an office for, for testing, I think they're probably less likely to be apprehensive about the equipment these days compared to how a child might have viewed a perimeter 30 years ago, for example. They understand games they understand that in a game you need to respond to targets. So I think it's a case of introducing the test as a game. So on their terms and at their level of understanding. Um, my children are um, you know, 16 and eight, 18 now, but at the ages of three and four years old, that's when I first introduced them to the Octopus 900 um, for one of our very early validation studies. Now, Acknowledging my parental bias, they had really reliable visual field results. And in fact, they were more likely to misbehave during testing because they only see me as mom, but their testing was actually pretty good. Um, there are definitely some practical elements though as well. Um, so from, from a very practical point of view, I think the primary one is position on the perimeter. 
um, you do need to build up the chin rest and there is a specific adaptation you can order for this and you know it, it, that's shown quite clearly um, on this slide you can see the build up um, chin rest um, but in addition it's just getting them into position first so they can kneel on a chair or they can sit on the parent's knee just to get that correct height position as well you, you don't want them straining to, um, to have their chin on that chin rest Very interesting. So um, let's move to, a, again, totally different tough topic, uh, driving evaluations. I mean, in the UK, the estimate test is the standard testing for um, visual uh, evaluation, fitness to drive. Uh, nevertheless, you sometimes use kinetic parametry. Could you explain us when? Yeah, so um, you're right. The, the UK requires a binocular estimate that's written into our DVLA guidance and it, you know, it, can, it conforms to the EU driving directive at present. And the estimate must be, be tested first, that has to be done. But occasionally we do do the um, binocular kinetic assessment as well. So an, an example would be a borderline result where there might be some losses um, within the, the central 40 degree area or on the, the peripheral boundaries. Um, we would use kinetic testing to outline those areas in more detail to show whether the defect is extensive or not for that for that particular area that's questionable. Um, another example for us is cases where there's a big difference between static and kinetic visual field results, you know, so-called statokinetic dissociation, which we do see. Um, so the, the kinetic assessment would show that you know, actually there's, there's quite a reasonable field of vision, whereas the static test shows an awful lot um, of losses. Um, in the UK as well, we do have the exceptional cases ruling where after one year of stable visual field loss, people can reapply to regain their license if they have adapted to the field defect. You know, there are certain conditions that they have to meet. So the, the added kinetic excuse me, the added kinetic assessment in those situations can be helpful in supporting some, but not all of those cases. You've also developed a template for this, right, which is, I, I guess, a bit based on the instrument test, but has on top of that kinetic vectors. Yeah, so it's definitely based on the estimate strategy. We designed it because um, there, were, there were going to be certain circumstances where we just didn't want to run two separate tests if we could avoid it, you know, particularly where there's fatigue and so on. Um, so we didn't want to run a binocular estimate, sort, you know, save that, sort it, and then run um, a kinetic test separately. So we effectively combined the two within this template. So it, it speeds up the testing by being able to combine that. And if you can speed up testing, reduce some fatigue, it can help with a better reliability of the test. Um, the template has static points laid out as for the estimate program. You can see the, the estimate program on, on the left-hand side of the screen there. But in addition, the, the template has a number of kinetic vectors using the size 3, 4 e stimulus, which is the same stimulus size used for the estimate program. Um, the kinetic vectors only plot the peripheral field boundary. Um, but so it's useful, but I, you know, it, it comes with the caveat. We, we don't tend to use it that often. Um, for all driving queries, we do have to do the estimate, but this is a very useful backup option for the small number of cases where we do want a combined assessment to speed things up. Excellent. Now let's um, move to totally different topics. Um, I mean, when we speak kinetic parametry, then often we're talking about manual Goldman parameter. I know that you at Liverpool have started using the Octopus 900, I think in 2008. Mm -hmm. And since then, you think, I think you've replaced all your manual Goldman parameters with an octopus uh, for kinetic testing. Uh, can you share with us why you've done that, where you see the benefits of an Octopus 900 for kinetic testing? Yeah, so I think 2007 is probably when I, I first saw the Octopus 900. Um, um, but yeah, we it was 2008 when we, we got one um, first for research and, and then very quickly for routine clinical use. At 
the time we got the 0900, the, the Goldman perimeter that we had um, was about 30 years old um, and it, it was well serviced, well maintained, but it hadn't had a filter change in years and years. So the target brightness was no longer as, as it should be. And it stayed working, but, you know, it became impossible to get parts for it. So, you know, in the end, it just became essential to adopt a changeover for good. Um, I think in many ways, we found it better to embrace a full changeover completely to the Octopus um, and just stop using the Goldman. And, and since the changeover, there have been considerable advantages. Um, we've been able to use the Octopus in the same way that we previously used the Goldman. Um, however, we very, very quickly came to value the semi-kinetic mode where the examiner still decides the strategy, but the perimeter controls the speed. And that has really helped with standardization. So we've got consistent results by removing operator bias um, from moving the target. Um, the other positives, um, I remember calibrating the Goldman. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I think we probably tried to calibrate the Goldman maybe, you know, once a week. I know some people did it maybe once a couple of months. It, it, that varied very much from clinic to clinic, but the octopus is calibrated automatically when you turn it on, which is great. It's, it's just done for you. Um, the octopus also automatically records your results. So you don't need to worry if your patient notes go missing. Um, if you do have electronic patient records, then you can obviously get the, the system to link up to that EPR system as well. And, and there's some nice features on the Octopus. So for another example, it's easy to log repeat vectors without having to delete previous vectors. You can add catch trials very, very easily. You've got the reaction time compensation, which we've mentioned earlier. And the screen shows um, underlays for the expected age match normative values. So you, you don't have to rely on clinician experience now if you're trying to determine if a field is constricted or not. So lo lots and lots of little advantages there. And of course, the templates that you can automatically store and just pull out, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, um, you can use the you can use customized templates that have already been made available for the octopus, or you can create your own. So and, and it's very easy to customize your own templates. I'm sometimes hearing the argument that an automated kinetic perimeter can never offer the same as Emmanuel Goldman perimeter. Would you agree with that, or what are your thoughts? No, so I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been able to use the octopus in pretty much in the same way as I used to use the Goldman. Um, and bear in mind, I've been using the Goldman for 20 years before the Octopus 900 came along. I do acknowledge that I've changed how I operate the octopus as I've used it more and more. Um, and essentially I've, I've got used to the octopus and I just feel I maximize its use now, although I'm you know, open to always learning new things with it, particularly as the software develops. Um, and in a way that you know, that's the same for the Goldman. Any examiner um, had to learn and get used to doing the Goldman. Um, and with more experience using the Goldman, they could maximize its use fully. Um, early on for Octopus, I used to use the freehand mode from time to time. But you know, very, very quickly, I was using the semi-kinetic mode most, uh, for most patients. Um, I've not used the freehand mode now for a long time. I think the last time I used it for it was for a patient who had functional visual field loss. So it was really, really useful to do the spiral field freehand. Um, but you know, I, I just feel I've completely adapted now to the advantages of semi-kinetic perimetry and, and just find it very easy and quick to use. As to whether the octopus does the same as the Goldman, well, th that, that was our question back in 2008 when we first got the octopus. You know, we weren't going to embrace it unless we knew that it did exactly what the Goldman did for us. And at the time, there was very little published on validating the octopus 900. So that was one of the first things that we set out to do with our own studies. Um, so the, the entire aim of the studies were, does the octopus 
perform just as the Goldman did in terms of providing accurate results. And remember, you know, the Goldman perimeter was our gold standard for kinetic perimetry. And most of us working in neuro practice would not be without kinetic perimetry. Um, and the studies showed, yeah, the octopus did live up to expectations with very accurate representation of visual field um, defects. Um, the octopus retains, crucially, it retains the key important features um, of the Goldman. So as an example, it's still a full bowl cupola, whereas other perimeters are not. Um, and a number of other perimeters um, have moved to having aspheric bowls to make their perimeters smaller. But that hardware choice introduces ceiling effects um, in the world of perimetry. So for, for us, we choose to adopt Octopus for kinetic perimetry um, for, for those variety of reasons. And I think you, you just said, um, right, you mentioned ceilings effect. Um, here is a study you've done comparing, uh, I think, the Goldman or kinetic with the Humphrey 850 and the kinetic uh, feature. So can you explain the ceiling effect, um, what you found out in the study? Yeah, so th this study was comparing the Octopus 900 um, with the Humphrey 850. And we took... Um, a group of 15 um, uh, participants with normal visual fields, and we plotted the 5 4E, 3 4E, 1 4E, um, and 1 2E targets um, on both perimeters exactly the same way. Um, and what we see here is um, bottom right is um, my visual fields. So, you know, I, I don't have to worry about confidentiality of another patient. Um, so my visual fields um, for the octopus on the bottom and for the Humphrey 850 um, on the top. The Humphrey has an aspheric bowl. So that basically means it cannot have a full vertical range in the superior and inferior visual fields because, because of that, um, that hardware. So presentation of targets are limited to 40 to 50 degrees superiorly and inferiorly. So you can see here you know, that it, it's, it's almost like a, an oval, it, it's cut, whereas on the octopus, you know, you, you get that, that nice full, full visual field. And that's just because of the full bowl that you have in the Octopus 900. Um, you know, tes testing is not a problem if you're only testing the central 30 degrees or horizontal ranges if you have an aspheric bowl. That, you know, that's absolutely fine. And that really, it's important to state that, but it is a problem if you want to test the field of vision directly in the superior and inferior field. And for us, that's an issue with chiasmal lesions. You know, we do see an awful lot of patients week in, week out who have chiasmal lesions. Um, and in addition, if you want to use kinetic perimetry for eye movement testing, as I mentioned before, so if you want to do a binocular field of single vision or a uniocular um, range of ocular rotations, you can't do this with an aspheric bowl because the range of target movement just isn't enough. Um, if you move to the next slide, um, Monica, um, I mean, I, our study only looked um, in a very, very small number of participants with Humphrey versus um, Octopus 900. But this is um, a Japanese publication by Chota Matsumoto's group. Um, and they, they did a comparison of four um, perimeters, kinetic perimeters. Um, so that's quite a really nice paper to read. Um, I've extracted out just the results section um, on this slide. But they noted the same issue with Humphrey kinetic perimetry, but also practical issues with other kinetic perimeters, um, such as you still haven't had examiner bias, or there was difficulty drawing the isopters or filling in the scotomas. So um, definitely a paper that I would recommend people read if they're, if they're interested in looking at these comparisons. Um, I know that getting back to the manual Goldman and why people love it so much, um, I often hear the argument there's so much personal interaction um, and then I get this automated device and that's kind of gone. Now. How do you feel about that? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, now, I don't think interaction is lost at all. And, and, you know, how many times have I mentioned interaction already? Um, you know, my colleagues and I talk to patients just as we did before. And I still feel just as engaged with the examination as I did with Goldman. If anything, I feel I have more control um, with the octopus perimeter. Um, you know, I can check as many vectors as I want to, but I don't, I know now that I'm not directly influencing the patient's response because the perimeter is moving the target at a consistent speed. You know, on Goldman, I know I will have altered the speed unconsciously and sometimes consciously when I was testing the patients. So I have much more confidence now in the consistency and the repeatability of results because that operator bias is removed. And, and particularly in my work where there are a number of examiners doing kinetic perimetry, you know, it's not just me consistently doing the testing um, for, from, from visit to visit. Um, but essentially the, the devices act the same. And so the perimeter interaction is similar, you know, you still make the choice of the target size and the brightness. So that's the same. You move a mouse instead of the pantograph handle. And this time you don't knock anybody on the back with the, <laughs> the handle flying around the back of the, um, the Goldman. So that's, that's a definite practical um, advantage. Um, and the template is the same, except it's on screen instead of on paper. Um, I remember in the very early days, some clinicians saying, but, but you know, the colors are different. You know, we, we always use blue for the 140, but in actual fact, you know, it's, just a, it's a computer. You can change the color um, for your stimulus sizes. So, you know, all, all of that remains the same. Um, and, you know, even if you choose to use octopus perimetry with a preset template and run it in automated mode, you still maintain interaction. In static perimetry, if you run an automated program, you can't alter it once it's running. It has to do what it was programmed to do. So if there's a problem in a static um, program, you either accept it and let the test run, or you have to restart or abandon the test altogether. With automated kinetic testing, you don't lose anything. You can step in at any time, you can reset things, make adjustments, and work with the patient until you get the best test that is possible for that patient at that particular time. Um, and one other thing, I think I've now got a better view of the patient with the octopus. On the Goldman, the patient and me were on either side of the, you know, we're completely opposite sides of the perimeter. So I had one eye on their fixation through the telescope and the other eye on, on the visual field plot. Whereas with the octopus, I'm on the side. So I can see the eye in the monitor, but I also see the side of the patient. So I can see how they're sat at the perimeter and I can make sure that you know, throughout the test, their overall position and comfort is being maintained. Um, and I can help head position if I need to. You know, I can put my hand at the back of their head to keep their head in position on the chin rest. You know, those of us who do field testing regularly know the patients who back off the chin rest or they move their head you know you can fix them in there if you need to and, and that's much much easier to do when you're side on as opposed to around the back so these are all very good arguments and i mean for me never having been trained on a goldman just not having to worry about the drawing i find a plus i don't know how i would learn in manual goldman obviously it doesn't apply to those who've already learned it um, just one last point. Uh, we do keep hearing um, that you get more inconsistent responses, that instead of the beautiful round isopters, you get something more star-like, and that's a criticism. Uh, what would be your response to that? Um, I, I don't, I'm not so sure that we do get the same inconsistent patient responses. Things look a little bit more different um, than, than on Goleman. Um, you know, as, as I said before, the, the testing is still the same in terms of you setting the, the vectors, changing target size, brightness, and all of that. Um, I do think the positioning definitely helps. It, it feels better because you can support the patient better while you still have full control of the test. In actual fact, the patient's probably, you know, some patients say that they find it more reassuring that you're beside them as well rather than behind. 
Um, I, I think when you set the position of the vectors, it gives you time to watch the patient as well when the test is running and you're watching you're watching for the response before you then set the next vector as well. So the whole thing flows quite well. Um, I've mentioned before that the catch trials should be built in um, and that's including false positives and false negatives. And that shows quite, quite nicely on, on this slide. Um, that gives you a little bit more information about ensuring you've got repeatability. So, you know, repeated testing of the random vectors for false negatives gives a very good indication of repeatability within the test. Um, and it highlights variability that you can then target and, and, and test that further if, if that's what you want to do. Um, and you know, apart from random checks, if you do have a suspect vector, you can just click on it and it, it will repeat again. So there are a lot of things you can do to iron out potential inconsistencies, um, but still very similar to how you did it with Goldman. All right. Um, I think in the interest of time, let's move on here. Um, just um, some piece of advice um, on people doing the transition, because um, it's not always that easy, right? I mean, you don't just walk out from your manual Goldman, start with your octopus, and you're all set. What, what would you personal recommendations be on the transitioning process? Um, well, I think there's always going to be challenges and discrepancies when you're changing from one perimeter to the other, you know, that, that's natural. Um, one key thing to remember is that this is a subjective test and the patient response is still the patient response regardless of which perimeter you use. Um, so for, for Goldman or octopus perimetry, we get a variety of responses, which you know, for kinetic perimetry are plotted first as dots on the template. Um, on Goldman perimeters, we would join these by hand. I, I can't speak for everybody, but when I was taught Goldman perimetry over 30 years ago, I was taught not to draw dot to dot, but to draw a smooth, cur a smooth curved line. Um, and that, you know, that would look nice. Um, and where there were field defects, then, then we would have um, quite a nice direct boundary. And all my colleagues did the same, regardless of where I've worked around the UK. It, that seemed to be consistent teaching. Um, Octopus Kinetic um, will join the dots for you. And you know, initially when you join the dots, they're, they're straight lines, but you can, you can then select the spline function um, and that gives you then the curved line. Still doesn't look quite the same as the Goldman, but you know, crucially, there's no examiner biased here. The computer is simply outlining the actual patient results. And actually, if you don't like it, don't join the, the um, dots, but print it out and join them yourself. It's, it's still the same thing. Um, but, uh, you know, in managing the transition, it, it is a change. And I think more often how we manage change is more about the person doing the change and how well they're trained and supported. Um, I mean, I built up quite a personal relationship with Goldman Perimetry over the, the 20 years prior to using the Octopus 900. And I know others have said exactly the same to me. Um, and when I've been on training courses, a, a number of people have said to me that they worried that their skills would be in some way tampered with um, by changing to Octopus. And I do understand where they're coming from, but in, in honesty, I never found that to be the case having changed over. Um, the octopus may move the target for me, but it's still me doing everything else. I choose the vectors, what target size and brightness I'm going to use. I decide if something needs to be repeated or checked. And I'm the one that's looking for potential defects. And if I find a suspect area, it's my choice of testing on how to explore that area further. So in that regard, nothing has changed. Um, you know, but I've learned to use a mouse instead of the Goldman handle. I've learned to click on computer screen buttons and, you know, things we have to do with any computerized system, which I don't think is difficult. We've had computers in clinical practice now for over 40 years. Most clinicians have their own smartphones, tablet devices and so on. So intelligent clinicians, I 
can't see are going to struggle to learn how to do how to use the octopus kinetic program at all and i don't see any difficulty particularly with it um what i do see are the positives um and, and you know these have been outlined you know over the over the last um the last hour or so um but when we changed the key to adapting practice was repeated practice and use um and by using the octopus that frequently it was only a matter of weeks before we were quite comfortable with it i think if you don't consistently and frequently use the octopus that's what's going to make your change over harder and just uh, as a last piece of advice i mean there's some people never used kinetic testing before um what would you recommend for them how to get started uh right so well i've i've taught this subject now for well, many many years um and you know that's been to to students as well as to, to qualified clinicians my suggestions are always going to be the same to anybody starting completely new at any clinical skill start by reading about kinetic perimetry and look at examples of results so you can get used to what normal looks like on kinetic and what abnormal results are like um, when you're reading build up an, an understanding about what kinetic perimetry means, why the target sizes and brightness levels um, are chosen, um, the choice of stimulus speed and, and so on. Um, and if possible, attend a training course. Many ophthalmology conferences offer visual field courses, but you do need to check whether the content is mainly on static or whether they do have a kinetic training option in there as well. Um, it's good to check with the company in your region or country that supplies your octopus perimeter because they may provide training courses. Um, I know this is the case for the UK and some other European countries because I've been invited to teach on some of those events. Um, then I suggest you shadow somebody in a field clinic, watch the testing being done, listen to the instructions being given, listen to how the examiner interacts with the patient during the test and always do the test yourself you know that this is the most crucial thing i totally and utterly believe that no one should be testing fields if they haven't done the test themselves and preferably more than once using different programs if you haven't done it, how on earth are you going to be able to empathize with patients and to actually understand what they say they're experiencing during the test? Um, and after that, it's just a case of doing the testing repeatedly, um, practice, build up experience, as we do for any clinical skill that we have to learn. Thank you very much. Um, now you, we talked about starting. Um, there's also people being quite advanced, um, but still, there's still a need for learning. So what kind of resources would you recommend? Um, there, there's a number of textbooks written on visual fields, um, and the more recently published versions have more examples of kinetic visual fields in them. Um, but I'd strongly recommend reading the published um, research on kinetic perimetry because that is very specific to kinetic perimetry. It'll give very good background and results from using kinetic, along with some very detailed discussions about the importance um, of those results and that, and that type of perimetry for certain conditions um, and indications. Um, anyone can do a literature search on PubMed, it's free, um, and you can pull the, the publications on kinetic perimetry from that. But actually, a, an alternative quick access to references specific to kinetic perimetry is to look at the reference sections in, in the various textbooks. So in the Visual Field Digest, um, it's uh, I can tell you because I've got to be here beside me. Um, there we go. It's page 233 and there is one yeah, there's a full page of references there. Um, but the same, if you look at some of the other textbooks as well, they will give re reference lists um, at the end of their each of their chapters and so on. Um, so, yeah, ha have a good read around the published literature as well as the textbooks. Okay, um, I think we're at the end of the session, at the end of the time. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rowe.
Um, and now it'd be time to ask some questions. We've run a bit over time. Uh, I didn't want to stop it because it was too interesting. I'm sure the audience felt the same. I haven't seen anybody leaving. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there's plenty of questions and we will continue and answer all of them. But if you have to leave early, um, we will send you an email with um, a link to the recording of this session. So if you have a question or have to leave, you can still ask it and we will get it answered for you. So let's jump right into things. Um, so there's the first question um, on a comparison of the Humphrey kinetic versus the octopus kinetic. I mean, you already talked about that ceiling effect. Um, we no, don't need to go through again, but in terms of you know, functionalities, options out there, did you notice any further differences between the two devices? Um, I think, well, the, the perimeter that we had access to is the new 850. Um, and I suppose the one thing that struck us straight away about the A50 is the improvement on um, the Series 7 um, Humphrey in, in that it, it was more, more, more user friendly than certainly it had been before. But in terms of um, its comparison to the Octopus, what we found is that when we did repeated vectors, um, you don't see all the repeated vectors where as you do on the octopus and certainly when you go to join the isopter um, it takes the most recent um, response to the vectors along that path so if you're looking at um, short-term fluctuation and, and that sort of thing um, it's it's much easier to see what's going on with the octopus because you can see all of the responses there and, and um, things don't disappear off the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then there's another very clinical question. Um, you mentioned statokinetic dissociation and the question is uh, what disease processes do you think it is associated with? Yeah, um, so I, I noticed that relatively frequent um, it's it's quite common bear in mind the, the cases I see the most of um, will be neurological cases um, with our stroke survivors and um, brain tumors and so on where I see it probably the most is where we've got partial defects so um, and and recovering lesions as well so we might have had a complete heminopia that's now recovering to a partial heminopia um, and that partial defect shows much more clearly on the kinetic, whereas when you, you do static, there still seems to be far more um, field loss being indicated by the static than there is actually showing on the kinetic. Um, and the same with quadrantic defects as well. Okay, then uh, one on templates. Um, what do you think about using visual field technicians? I'm, I, I understand there as being visual field technicians as opposed to our FOP desk um, to run kinetic templates in neuroclinic. Um, I, I don't have an issue at all with, te uh, with technicians using the templates. Um, and, and in fact, I mean, the key thing about using templates is to try and promote standardization amongst everybody doing visual fields um, from visit to visit. And when you've got a number of different people within the field clinic doing the testing, um, you know, it's, it's pressing a button, letting the template run, but it's actually knowing what to do with that result. And, you know, the, the same thing applies with static. It's, it's about knowing what to do. And one of the key things here is making sure that whoever it is doing your visual fields has had sufficient training and support um, with that skill set. Sure. And I mean, I think for everything we do in life, that's important. Um, there is a technical question on the template in terms of how you changed it, if I may answer that, because it depends on the software version, really, um, how to do it exactly. Um, so my advice would be to reach out to your local Huckstrike customer support to help you with that. Um, it's probably the easiest. I think the other answer is going to be a bit too extensive uh, for, for this training. Um, there's another question and I, kind of an interesting one, um, which is, um, so why, you know, why is kinetic perimetry not more often used or, you know, I mean, some people are calling this a thing of the past. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I hear that quite a lot as well. Um, 
and it goes back there, there's a there's a bit of a training element here but we need to remember that when we're doing static perimetry there's also a training element there um i think people have really got used to static because you know if you if you're only going to choose one program or if you've got a list of conditions and a list of programs it depends on what goes on in your clinic but people get used to choosing one particular program and, and just running that so what's gone alongside that i suspect is that there's now less consideration towards choosing the right test for the condition um, and there's also some misperceptions i suspect about the timing of the test as well um, people assume that it, it's going to take a very long time to test with kinetic and more than static and i don't think that's necessarily the case and certainly from the research studies that we ran, where we also plotted the duration of test alongside all of the other factors that we were gathering, that it, that was not borne out. Um, in fact, kinetic in many instances was faster than the appropriate static test. So yes, it's kinetic is not used as much, but I think that really is because we're not thinking about, you know, should we actually be doing that is kinetic better for that particular condition and doing what is best for the patient and best for that condition. Right. And you've just managed to answer another question we had, which is in the speed of kinetic testing compared to static. Yeah. I, I guess it depends a bit on the indication, right? It, yeah, it, it does. So um, I think if you were to run a full threshold strategy in a patient who has got a visual field test, we know that's going to be quite a lengthy period of time. And kinetic is most definitely as quick, if not quicker, on some of those um, situations. We know kinetic is quicker than some of the static screening assessments of the peripheral field. Um, for example, um, one of our studies com compared it to a full field 120. Um, so that was definitely faster there. And if you're just going to do a screening assessment, it's definitely faster. You can do a good screening assessment in a couple of minutes. Right. And I mean, that's definitely also my personal experience. I mean, what we have to do for registration purpose, some full field extensive tests, and uh, we're not very popular in the company asking people to do that. Um, so here's an interesting one on, on manual Goldman parameters uh, from a clinic that's using a very old one, um, also limited financial resources to just buy a new one, a new octopus or something similar. Um, on the calibration because it's um, the the light intensity is not as it should be anymore. There's no spare parts. They use the visual field mostly to keep track of patients with retinitis pigmentosa, hemianopias, mac look for macular sparings, uh, look for restrictors fields, and want to see whether the fields are good enough for driving. And and the question is kind of bit, is that still good enough to continue using that old Goldman? Or do they strictly need to change? And if not, what could, you know, any pieces of advice, how they can best use their manual Goldman that they have? Okay, so I'm so on that question. Um, I'm assuming that it's it's all Goldman. They haven't changed parts in a long time now because you, you, you can't get the parts. If you've got that sort of equipment running with an old filter set, your stimulus is going to be dimmer than it should actually be. Um, so even though you've, you've calibrated it as best as you can, a 1.4, if we take, for example, a 1.4E stimulus target that should be at a certain decibel level, it's not going to be at that decibel level. The problem there is if you want to compare visual fields over time, you're not comparing like with like. So if you're testing at a repeat visit and the visual field looks worse, the defect looks more extensive in size, for example, then you don't know whether that's because the target dimness is making it worse or whether the field has actually progressed. If you're just going to use a very old perimeter just as a yes no screening option is there a defect there or not and roughly what type of defect it is then yes that's fine um but that you know you really have to have that in your mind that 
you don't have the accuracy there. It's, it's just there as a, a diagnostic aid more than anything. All right. Um, I mean, I think that's a good recommendation, a pragmatic one too. Uh, um, here's a very practical one um, and an inexpert one, I have to say. So try, let me try to get this right. Um, uh, it's from a user who's um, starting from the outside, moving to the center of visual field with vectors, and at some point the patient responds, um, and they want to continue running this vectors. I get. I assume to look for islands of vision loss uh, further within the within the visual field, um, and they currently redraw all these vectors. Is there any fun other way of doing that? Um, and I, I don't think so, right? <laughs> no, right. So I think uh, I take home with me um, that maybe something we have to look into as yeah, a functionality. I mean, it's, it, it's or how do you deal with that? It, you just it, you just have to remember you're using the mouse instead of the Goldman handle. So when, when you have the Goldman, you'd you would pull it in and you would stop when they responded. And if you knew that you wanted to carry on, then when they responded, you carry on again and say to the patient, tell me when it comes back again, and then you carry on. So you were you're constantly moving while talking to the patient. It, to run it in octopus, you'll click and the target will move in. And when the patient has responded, you say, right, when you see it again, let me know. And you just click from where they responded and let it run. So you're just clicking and it does have to run back into the center. I think what will happen is on, on the Goldman, obviously, all you're doing then is marking the patient's response. So you just have a mark on the sheet. Your screen on the octopus could get very busy because you've got lots of then of vectors. But there is an option on the um, octopus that you can turn that off. You don't have to show the vectors. And that just leaves the patient response little dot. And those can be joined um, and in the same way that you would have done with the Goldman. So yeah, you can you can't you can't get a continuous um, vector. You just can't do that in, in comparison to the Goldman. But there is a you know, there's a way around it and you just carry on testing as you would have done. Oh, thank you very much. And there's a question on um, the reactant time vectors, whether you put them before the actual vectors you're testing or after. After, after. So after yeah. when the patient's tired, <laughs> how you do that? Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the reaction time vector has to run in an area where you know the, the patient can see, right. because otherwise you're not testing the reaction time. Um, there is a caveat, obviously, if, you, if you're using a template, the template has all of the vectors set up, including the reaction time vectors. And if one of those vectors is within an area that the, the patient then subsequently can't see in, then you need to delete that one out and add in one in, you know, in an area where they can see. But if you're doing the test from scratch, you know, you're, you're, you're right. running it bit by bit, then yeah, you just put in the reaction time vectors afterwards when, when you know where the field of vision is. Good. Um, then another one. Um, how far apart are you putting the vectors that straddle the horizontal and vertical meridians? Like, is it five degrees, ten degrees, or you no, know, what's your couple, two to three degrees from okay. the bottom. So if, if the vertical's there, it's just a couple of degrees to either side. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, we're getting closer to answering all the questions. Um, there's one on central fixation point, which seems to be the standard for kinetic, which is not on the octopus and static. Can you explain um, why the point is, is good? And there's something I've never heard before, the Truxler effect, whether that wouldn't come into play when using a central point for such a duration of time. Yeah, so... Um... But most people will know what the Troxler effect is just by the patient's description. So when, when, you, um, when you fixate a point, a single point in the middle, and you are really, really focused on it, because let's face it, when, when we're doing perimetry, we tell the patients, don't look away from the center, you know, keep watching that central target. But if you fixate um, in a very concentrated way, what the patient will tell you is that the rest, the, the background appears to go darker. It's a washout effect. Um, and the way I always try and um, explain it when I'm teaching is that um, if you're using um, 
on a computer screen, you've got you've got a constant refresh rate so that you know that the screen is still nice and clear. And it's the same within the visual system. If you're not blinking frequently enough and you're concentrating on, on just one area too much, the rest will actually fade out. Um, so the key thing here is instruction for your patients. Um, we do want them to carry on fixing central. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it is a central green light um, when we're using the kinetic mode, whereas in static, you can choose the little diamond pattern. Um, but actually, if you keep saying to the patient, look, you know, it's really important that you blink frequently. We don't want them having a bit of a dry eye or, you know, getting a gritty eye during the process either. And I just say to them, look, carry on blinking frequently. You're not going to miss anything. And actually, the best time to blink is when you're clicking the response button um, to respond to the stimulus, because the, you know, the perimeter can't do anything about you blinking when you're <laughs> pressing the response button. Um, and that, that keeps things fresh. Um, I have to say, from my clinical experience, I don't notice that effect as much with kinetic testing as I do with static. It's actually very frequently um, reported by patients during static but not so much in kinetic. I guess because it's a bit more interesting with the moving stimuli, yeah, right? Yeah, that's a bit, bit more interactive, all of that sort of thing. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it still goes back to your patient instruction being very important. Then there's a question on the CATCH trials. I think it must maybe a bit fast when you presented them. How do you actually really do them? Right, so, um, well, false negative sort of couple up with short-term fluctuation. Um, so for that, it's just repeated vectors. Um, okay. Two to three, um, so for each isopter, probably two to three vectors should be repeated. And what you're looking to see is that the responses are close together. So that's good. That's showing that there's not major fluctuation within the visual field. And also if there was a big difference if they responded once and not the next time, then um, that's obviously a false negative. Um, so repeated vectors um, deal with that sort of catch trial. Mm -hmm. False positives, we put um, a vector deliberately in an area where it shouldn't be seen. So if you're testing, for example, a 1-2-E, so your central target, you're going to put one much, much further out. And the same for a peripheral target. You want it outside where they should be expected to respond to it. So if they do respond, <laughs> it's because they've been looking around. And let's face it, you're going to see that they were looking around if you're monitoring their fixation um, through the... Uh, through right. The and uh, just a follow-up question on the repetitions, um, more related to patient instructions, actually, where where um, I guess the user is um, using a technique that they always have one or two initial vectors they don't count just as an instructive vectors. And the question is, should you do that for each target or just in the beginning or how do you deal with that? Okay, um, I do it just at, at the start. And the only time I keep repeating is if the responses are not what I expect it to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm very much led by the patient responses. To be fair, when I'm switching targets, I do warn the patient. So if I'm going from a 1-4-E target down to a 1-2-E target, I'll say, actually, from now on in, the targets are going to be dimmer. That's what you need to be looking out for now. Um, and I, I don't think telling the patient that you're changing targets is introducing any bias. I've, I've not had any particular problems mm -hmm. with that. So yeah, it's it's a good idea if, if a patient response is not as you've expected and you think it's because um, the target has changed or um, you know, they're not quite sure what they're looking for, there is absolutely no harm repeating a vector. And I think that's good practice, mm -hmm. you know, re repeat vectors if it's, um, if it's an unexpected response. You're looking for consistency and it's quick to do. Okay, um, then one on fixation control. I mean, in static testing, at least the octopus pauses the test and his patient looking around or blinking. Yeah. Um, in kinetic, it doesn't happen because, you know, else you would have to repeat a ton of vectors yeah. again and again. Um, do you think there are issues with fixation loss or do you think there are more than with static or do you think it's just down to good monitoring, good patient monitoring? You're... You, you are going to be monitoring um, right. by, by looking at, at, at the patient's eye on the, on the screen. Um, 
I think we need to remember that actually, even if you're doing static perimetry, you're also monitoring patient fixation um, on a number of times. Um, I've, um, sorry, my mind has just gone blank on that one now. Um, I, you know, I've, I've been running the fixation monitoring and even so the patient's fixation is still not very good and you know, they're all over the place. Um, so the, the examiner monitoring is important in static as well as in kinetic. Um, and it's just a case about letting them know, I can see that your, your eye is moving. And with kinetic, you don't take the response for that vector if, they're, if their um, fixation is moving. So, right, because you see it and you can um, directly interfere. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, just, just a follow-up question again on the central point instead of the cross mark. Um, well, the user understands the blinking part, but why is it a central point and not a cross mark for kinetic? I, don't I mean, my, my assumption is that in the static, because you know where the points are, you know that the cross mark is not interfering, right? So you know where to put it, whereas in kinetic, where it can be, response can be all over the place, uh, probably, a central point is a bit more safe. Yeah, you, I mean, the central point is marking your central fixation. Um, and if you've got marks elsewhere within the bowl, you don't want a moving target crossing over those marks. Mm -hmm. In the same way that um, if you think about, it, we, we've got mirrors within the bowl. Um, and equally, we don't want to be running the kinetic vector through those mirrors. Um, so it's making sure that we're not interfering with the detection um, of, of right. the target that we're using. Yeah. Okay, now I'm trying to put together two questions. Um, one is on standardization, or actually the lack of standardization. And then the second question is, uh, still, would you recommend a 5-4-E, 3 4 e one for e as a chosen standardized vector set? Is that a good choice or...? Um, yeah, our, our choice, um, we do, a lot of us do what we were taught to do. Um, and certainly when I was taught, we, we would start off with the smallest, brightest target, which is a 1-4-E. That, that was our starting point. And if that gave us a good normal peripheral field of view, we would then move to a 1-2-E um, to test the central visual field. Um, I would then move from a 1-4-E up to a 3-4-E um, if I found defects um, and I want to explore them because obviously you're looking to see whether a defect is relative versus absolute. Mm -hmm. And the next jump from a 3-4-E for from me would be up to a 5-4-E, which is the biggest, brightest target. Um, and that's always just been the way that I've done. <laughs> I know people, have, they choose different different target sizes, but they're the ones I've always chosen. Um, we did do a survey, um, it's a number of years ago now, asking that question just to see whether there was uh, more of a standardized procedure across the UK. And actually it seemed to be that that is what the majority, and I'd say 90, 95% of people responding to that survey um, use the same sort of testing choice. So you're not kind of starting totally out, but somewhere in the middle. So if everything's found find the periphery, you save yourself these extra vectors, right? It's a kind of time-saving measure, I think. It is. Um, it, I mean, the exception to that is if I want to do, if I know all I want to do is a rapid screening test, then we choose a 3-4-E target. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, along the lines that it's a 3-4-E target size that's actually used in static as well. And it's also a 3-4-E target size that's used for a driving assessment. So that's a good, a good go-to when you want mm -hmm. to do something very, very quick. Um, mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're actually looking to properly um, test and uh, delineate visual fields, then we, we always start with a 1-4-E. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's what I've done for years. Okay, then a question on the quantification features of the octopus. You can uh, measure area square, I think, or degree square. Um, what's the benefit of that, or how are you using this? Yeah, so if you when when you've when you've joined your um, your isopter and you right click to join, if you also right click, it gives you the option to measure. 
And then for that particular eye softer um, or field effect or blind spot, whatever, whatever it is you've, you've just measured and joined together, um, you will get an area measurement for that in degrees squared. It's the, the use of that is that you're not only then comparing um, the visual field picture from visit to visit, you actually have an area measure that you can compare, can compare mm -hmm. from visit to visit. So if something is um, getting better, you mm -hmm. see that, that obviously the area right. score um, increasing. And it, it's just, I think it's just a good thing to be doing as, as routine practice um, that you get the area measurement in there as well as everything else. Okay, then we're getting to the end of the questions, unless there's more popping up. Um, the question is on uh, spot checks between isopters to search for scotomas. Um, I know the person answer, asking the question, and now he does a whole lot of retinal and peripheral retinal um, visual field testing as well. Yeah. Um, could you comment on that? Is it as important in neurological testing? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's... Um, very, very little testing that I do that doesn't have spot checks in it. Um, and I will, I will do spot checks with a static stimulus. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's just routine for us. I think it's actually really important that you combine the two. Um, and in some of the, the studies that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, one, one of the reasons why our kinetic testing, why our kinetic testing wasn't even faster is because not only were we actually plotting the kinetic boundaries, but it included static spot checks within each of those boundaries um, with uh, one four E static points, one two E static points or, you know, or whatever. But I think it's crucial that you are checking within the visual field. You don't know if you plot a good outer visual field that there isn't a problem in the central visual field and the spot checks help you find that. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I think we are at the end of the session. I'd like to thank everyone who stayed on. I especially like to thank uh, Professor Rowe. I mean, you've answered so many questions that um, I know are um, open and need to be answered. Um, of course, always in your friendly manner that I much appreciate. <laughs> We've known each other for quite a long time. Um, for, for everyone, um, before you leave, when actually when you exit, um, there's going to be a quick questionnaire. We'd appreciate you answering the three questions out there. So just that we know how you liked it, uh, whether there's anything we can improve. Uh, life is learning, so there's always something we can improve. Um, yeah, and as I said, you'll get a follow-up email with the recording. You get a follow-up email with all the resources, the Visual Field Digest resources, the e-learning module, and if you like that lecture, there's three more next week. Um, one in German on basic mission field interpretation by myself, one by Dr. George Rees on parameter options and challenging cases. And I think uh, most importantly for you listening to Kinetic, uh, the one with uh, Sandra Mooring on Goldman Gems. Um, Sandra has plenty of experience with the octopus. She's a Oxide product specialist, been for 17 years. so. Um, she for sure gives you um, a different view on the same topic. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Professor Rowe. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.